The word innovation is on everyone's lips, but innovation has a thousand faces. Blockchain, renewable energy, artificial intelligence, digital transformation, virtual reality, entrepreneurship, diversity, space. Innovation means new technologies, new behaviours, new mindsets. So how can we make sense of it all? How do we clarify these new dynamics to better navigate today and tomorrow's disruptions? Let's dig deeper. Let's dive into the wide world of innovation with the experts. Welcome to the AXA Live Innovation Talks. Welcome to the AXA Life Innovation Talks, where we talk about all important topics such as climate, health, financial inclusion. And please react on YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, we're available, we're there for you during the show. Also, uh, today we are going to talk about a very important topic, which is about cars, uh, and which is of interest to many people. We're very proud to have three uh, uh, important guests with us here today. First of all, we have Karim Kadura. Karim, welcome. You are the co-founder of Virtuo. Virtuo is a company which basically offers a solution for people who don't own a car but need to go on a longer trip. Uh, more about that later. We have Vincent Moindreau. Uh, Vincent Moindreau is the CEO of Car Lily. Welcome, Vincent. And Car Lily is a an app, a platform, which offers the possibility to car owners to share their car and to people who are in need of a car uh, with a few clicks to get on the road. And last but not least, we have Alistair Crosley. Alistair, welcome. You're an AXA guy. You're responsible for our motor roadside assistance offering around the world. And you're also responsible for uh, inventing and delivering new innovative Platform. So let's get going with the show. So uh, first of all, I would like to introduce the topic a little bit to the three of you. We all know that the motor industry today is facing important challenges uh, from an environmental point of view, from a political point of view, and uh, also uh, from a societal point of view. And so uh, for this show, we have identified a number of challenges. One is uh, as you might very well know, the drivetrain. Uh, clearly, today, uh, most of the cars are still petrol or uh, diesel driven, but that is changing very rapidly. A second uh, item is the connected cars and everything which has to do about it. Is it a gimmick or is it really something useful? Cars which are connected, but which come more and more also connected to your home. And a third element is everything around mobility. Do we still need to own a car, uh, one or two or three, or uh, how do uh, our guests see that going forward? Now, uh, how will the motor industry adapt? Uh, what are the challenges it's already working on? And what are challenges or, uh, that they still need to uh, get their heads together in order to find a solution? So, um, let me just throw a question at you. I would like you to, of course, first uh, introduce yourself uh, in a very short manner uh, but also I would like you uh, to respond to the following question. Uh, there were 100 million cars sold in 2017, there were 67 million cars sold in 2021. Is that a trend? So Karim, first to you. Thank you Jeff. Um, so Virtue is, uh, as you said, an application that allows our users to rent a car seamlessly 24-7. Um, and going back to, you know, the point you've, you've made, uh, our vision is why, you know, what would you own a car if you can rent one on demand? And so, you know, going back to the main question, uh, I think you can't escape the numbers. Pre-pandemic, 100 million cars approximately were produced. And what happened recently is, uh, you know, obviously unfortunate, but it's a supply-led type of situation. It's not, it, evidently not a demand-led situation. So the declining numbers shouldn't attest that car ownership is actually disappearing. Uh, our view on that is, uh, again, 90, I think 85% of US commutes are done with a car. So no, car ownership is not dead. Um, and there, there's, there's many reasons why it's not dead. It's one of you know, the most practical mode of transportation. And by the way, if, if cities are as such, i.e. 
you know, our cities were built around cars. So unless you have 15 minute very compact cities with the densest transport network networks, you'll always see you know, car ownership thrive. Um, our vision at Virtual is that you know, your motivation to own a car or actually rent one and use mobility services is really linked to where you live. I live in Paris. I have absolutely no motivation to own a car because there's simply put a density that allows mobility options to exist. And so I go around and use virtual, as you said, to go on longer trips as much as I use ride hailing and micro mobility or my personal bicycle uh, to move on a daily. On the I daily like basis. that. I keep my bike here today. Oh, I uh, use my bike, bike in Paris uh, every time. Yeah. So, I, no, I mean, to the, to the question, I don't think car ownership is dead. I think there's just a, a complete uh, shift in terms of motivation towards our relationship with cars when it, when it comes to living in a big city. Uh, when you live in Brittany and France and you have 85% of people owning a car on a daily basis, it's, it's just that you can't do otherwise. And so, uh, so I'd say as long as cities st remain the same, uh, that will not evolve. Okay, okay. Thank you, Karim. Uh, so, uh, Vincent, uh, what about uh, the future of car uh, sales numbers? So, from 100 to 67, how do you see that going? Yeah, I, I totally share the opinion of Karim, and I, I want to comply with that with my own story that I'd like to share today. I grew up in a very uh, desertical area of France called Ardèche. You know, it's very far from Paris. Very nice and now area. I live, it's quite nice, yes. Um, now I live in Paris, but what I, what I tell every time is that the best day of my life between my, uh, when I, I was born and my 20s was when I received my license. I was able to drive a car just because one, I was able to have another friend. My only friend was my neighbor. Two, I was able to have a girlfriend. Three, I was able to enjoy an opening on the world and new culture. And I think this will remain true a anywhere uh, from uh, today. So yes, the car is not dead. The car is the best way to open to the world if you live in very uh, uncrowded areas like Ardèche in France. And I totally share the, the vision of Karim that you can, in a city like Paris, like I live today, you can ride your bike every day, you can take alternative modes of transportation, which by the way are better for our future in terms of climate, uh, but you need a car for some long distances. And this is exactly where Car Lily happens because we deliver you, we deliver to your doorstep, the car you need, so you don't even need to cross the city to find a car. It's coming to your home, to your doorstep. Okay, uh, that sounds great. So, uh, uh, Alastair, uh, so what do you think about uh, car sales numbers going forward and how do you see that? Thank you, Jeff. I don't think the, uh, the use of cars is dead at all, and I think I echo the, the fellow uh, panel members. Um, but I think it's changing. We still have a need for mobility. Um, and, and I think the pandemic has accelerated a shift in that use of mobility. Um, we'd already established working practices where working from home, smart working, but I think the pandemic has brought that forward uh, decades quicker than perhaps it would have established otherwise. And so our use of the vehicle is changing. You know, long gone is the Monday morning commute for many people now, and we are choosing when we want to use a car and when we want to use alternative mobility. So yes, there'll be a continued need and the continued use of vehicles, but I think the demand for that and the demand for when we use those vehicles will change. Okay, Alistair, and so um, let me uh, ask you a first question. What is the motivation of, um, of car owners, renters, users, whenever they go uh, and they need uh, to go on a trip, they need to commute, uh, how do you see that and do you see that changing uh, in this uh, today's environment? I think it's needs-based motivation. I think um, the need to keep mobile. Um, we, were gonna we will continue to see that demand for mobility, but mobility is changing. There are new models and new modes of mobility coming to the market all the time, and it's a very exciting time. Um, we see many more people now using app-based applications, either to rent a car on a short time period or a longer time period. Uh, car sharing is really growing. 35% uh, of millennials say they're very happy to car share. Or indeed, very short one-way trips, Uber, for example, is now commonplace in all big cities. So uh, I think the motivation is now shifting away from having to own a car and pilot a car to very much, how do I get from A to B? And there are a variety of different ways and mechanisms that you can do that now. Okay, okay. Karim, uh, a question for you. Uh, tell me a little bit more about Virtuo and uh, basically your, uh, uh, your drive to launch Virtuo as a co-founder. 
I, th I think initially, um, you know, th this idea stemmed from the fact that, as Alistair mentioned, mobility is, on, you know, in, a, in an ongoing revolution, the way we move is completely uh, disrupted and, and completely changed in the last 10 years, uh, definitely. Everything is powered by applications, uh, technology. Um, the motivation behind virtual was simply that, you know, we looked at all space for mobility, understood that Uber was grasping a market that was, you know, very urban, uh, led and we looked at the long distance mobility needs and said, okay, I mean, the only way to go about it is either to own a car and we, d you know, don't think that's the responsible thing to do when you live in a city uh, or you can rent a traditional car uh, at a traditional car rental company. And we think that that's full of frictions. Uh, you know, going to a counter, waiting in line, signing paperwork is a nightmare. And so we looked into it and said, okay, I think the best thing to do is to get rid of the counter and make sure that thanks to an app, our customers are fully autonomous in the way they conduct their journey. And so it's, it's a, you know, very simple applications where you just register, we validate your profile, you book a car among a catalog of different new cars. And then you know, where the real magic happens is on a rental day, you, you click on a button and unlocks your car, it starts your car. Um, I think that's the future of car ownership, which we call internally cars on demand. You know, why would you own a car if you can rent one on demand? That, so that's the motivation behind the company. Okay, so car ownership on demand, that's, uh, that's a good one. I'll remember that one, yeah. Uh, Vincent, maybe same question for you. So uh, what makes you tick? Why are you so happy to be uh, CEO of Car Lily? Uh, tell me a little oh, bit many. more about that. <laughs> many things make me happy in building a company, crafting a, a new venture with uh, amazing people every day. Uh, but uh, yeah, the motivation behind is clearly that we all face a problem regarding climate change. Cars, depending on studies, is responsible for 10 to 15 percent of the greenhouse gas emissions. And we think when it comes to this problem, we have to tackle it by the first, very first step, which is to reduce the number of cars. So that's when we talk about car sharing, car on demand. It's all about having an asset, which is a car that is shared between different usages, between different people. So you, instead of having 10 cars for 10 people, you'll have one car for 10 people approximately. So that's our main motivation when we launched the company. We are very mission-based. We, we work on this, uh, on this purpose every day. That makes us happy. Okay. I have a follow-up question for you. Uh, so uh, we see uh, an evolution towards uh, electrical vehicles, uh, hybrid vehicles. There were 4 million ve uh, electric vehicles sold in 2020 and clearly uh, with current oil prices, definitely that's going to soar. Uh, how do you see that happening? Is the petrol car and the diesel car, will that soon be a thing of the past? Can you uh, share some insights on that topic? Yeah, well, first, let's celebrate that. I mean, that's pretty amazing what's, what we've achieved all together. Uh, and I'm, I'm very happy with this new trend, to be, to be honest with you. Um, then secondly, I think the market is pretty divided with new incumbers. Um, and let's mention it. I mean, Tesla has taken a great advance on this market. The best, the, mo the model that has been sold the most in uh, last year was the Model 3. So this, they have taken some advance that would be very hard to catch back. And we are big believers at uh, Carlyle of this next move. Uh, we are getting closer to this company as well. Um, and we think that it's not a matter of um, how fast they've been innovating on the electricity itself or the electrical powered engine itself, but on every step of the value chain so just one figure, for example, today Volkswagen takes 30 minutes to build an electrical vehicle, fully electrical, Tesla 10 minutes with the uh, data shared by uh, Volkswagen CEO. So they have taken a great advances and I think it will be very hard to catch. So I think they have a bright uh, future and they will probably become market leader within a few years. Yes, uh, I agree. It's uh, the advantage from the new kit on the block. They didn't have any legacy. They could design a car from scratch. And so uh, their, indeed their, uh, their productivity numbers are very impressive as well as their customer experience or driver experience. So, okay, a uh, big challenge for the existing uh, motor industry, uh, but they're working on it. And I'm, I, I'm f I feel confident that Tesla already has and soon will have some uh, formidable uh, existing competitors uh, to make their uh, life difficult. So Vincent, a little bit the same, uh, sorry, uh, Karim, a little bit the same question for you. Um, electrical cars, uh, how do you see that uh, migration? Do you think it will be hybrid for a long time? Diesel, 
Uh, what's your view on that? Well, I think first off, going back on you know, what's been said, as a tech company, um, you're by definition mission oriented. Uh, the way we view and you know, is saying that uh, the reason why we do what we do is, is to think that ownership you know, shouldn't sustain and therefore, there's, there's eminently b behind that a, a willingness to change things for a better, better future. So, you know, going back to electrification and electric cars, we have many objectives and targets that are clear within the company. The first thing is that we're going to transition our fleet from, you know, currently 10% uh, of electrified vehicles to actually 50% by 2025. So it's a big number. It requires a lot of things, operationally speaking. And obviously, it, it's not only on us. We depend on infrastructures. Uh, to the question, which is, you know, do we think that electric cars will uh, remain and i.e. gasoline and diesel cars will, will be dead? I, I think there's no debate on that anymore. And there's, you know, car makers are doing big plans and uh, saying that they're going to phase out all gasoline and diesel cars by, t you know, 2030 for some, 2035 for others. Cities are also doing the same, banning combustion engines uh, from the city center and so on and so forth. So it, it is going to be the future. Um, I think it's exciting for consumers in the sense that the game is no longer a hardware game. It's a game of software, uh, primarily because there's lower barriers to entry. So that's why there's new kids on the block, as you call them, is that uh, what used to be proprietary and very difficult to, to fabricate, which is engines, is, is no longer a need. So it's, you know, batteries are the new engines. Uh, which is, by the way, a great thing to see. Uh, you'll see massive adoptions in the next year. I think all the forecasts that predicted numbers on EVs are completely shattered now uh, for the good. Um, uh, you know, people expect 50% of all sales in 2025 to be fully electric. And so that, that's something we love to see and we obviously fully embrace and getting prepared for that. Okay, so I'll remember one thing, Virtuo will have 50% uh, of electric cars uh, in its fleet by 2025 then. Okay, that uh, sounds promising. Uh, Alistair, uh, any ideas on the shift to electric? Uh? Yes, I think the, the shift to electric is coming from two key facets. I think there's consumer-led demand. Consumers want green alternatives. And then I think we've got the, the government policy shift. And uh, Karim's already talked about it, but in the UK, uh, combustion engine vehicles will be banned from 2030. Uh, here in France, it's 2035, the same in the US and the same in Germany. So that's going to drive a significant amount of innovation. And we'll see more new entrants coming into the marketplace. Um, as was already mentioned, the barriers to entry have now been removed. Uh, an electric vehicle takes one third of the components of a combustion engine vehicle. So it's much easier for new entrants to come into the marketplace. And I think over the coming years, we'll see even more and more uh, of these new companies uh, fighting for uh, market share and, and winning that market share from some of the big known brands that we see today. Okay, thank you, Alistair. Uh, Karim, a next question for you. Uh, so personally, uh, I'm a very big fan of hydrogen, and, uh, but it has been called always the technology of tomorrow. Uh, so, uh, but definitely, I think uh, that there is a space for hydrogen uh, for lorries, trucks, uh, ships, uh, uh, Toyota uh, and Hyundai are uh, producing hydrogen-powered cars. Do you have any ideas, uh, insights on uh, the all-important and very clean hydrogen uh, ecosystem? Yeah, well, you know, I'd, I'd start by saying I'm no expert of that topic. What I, you know, do read and see and, and interact with entrepreneurs that are in that field and, and car manufacturers is that, you know, some say that it's foolish, if you take Tesla's word. Uh, but again, they're probably biased in, in the way they say things. And, and others, such as Japanese car makers and Koreans, are very bullish about it and investing lots of money into it. Um, uh, you know, I think the benefits are range are pretty similar to electric cars uh, and charging, refueling uh, of those uh, uh, hydrogen cells cars is faster. Right? And so from a convenience standpoint, it's amazing. Uh, on, on the question marks, uh, there's questions around, you know, is, is it as sustainable as EVs in the way Hydrogen is currently produced, is it uh, as sustainable? And the other question mark is, um, you know, truthfully, is it, uh, is it something that we can see in, in the next years or so? Um, and, and there's, you know, huge interrogations there. So mass production hydrogen cars, I think will not happen in the next years, most definitely. And the focus right now is, is fully on electric cars. And so um, you're gonna have a lag between electric cars and hydrogen. But there's no way in doubt that uh, I think in, you know, what we used to call diesel and, and, and petrol cars will be replaced by EVs and, and hydrogen. 
Okay, Alistair, any ideas on uh, the potential of uh, hydrogen? I think at this stage, um, the hydrogen car is, is still fairly niche. I think what we'll need to see is the development of the EV first. Um, what we do know is that we've got this uh, a vast melting pot of innovation at the moment. Um, and that will drive more and more new technology to come into the marketplace. And it'll be really exciting to see how that, how that comes to fruition. I think from hydrogen specifically, it will, it will depend on how well and how quickly the EV market adapts. If we can see fast charging and we can see the convenience factor that hydrogen could potentially give, replicated in EV, then that might make it more difficult for hydrogen vehicles in the mainstream. I think, as you mentioned, in terms of ships and trucks and things, I think that's a different, a different marketplace. And I can see more innovation coming through there. Okay. Uh, Vincent, any, any thoughts on uh, hydrogen? I'm a big fan, yeah, so yeah, please. what I wanted to say. If you're a big fan, I, I try to be very positive around it. Uh, I, I share the opinions of my neighbors that it's not the technology of today for cars, unfortunately for you, Jeff, I'm sorry for that. Uh, just for maybe for captive usage, captive fleets, uh, we've seen in, in a, right here in Paris, there's a company that uh, proposed a, a cab service based on a hydrogen fleet of vehicles from Toyota, and it's working very well. So that works because you just have a few charging stations which are very, very uh, expensive to build. Um, so that works. If you think high scale, uh, imagine doing the same on electrical with hydrogen is not possible in my opinion today just because of the money it costs but maybe in the future it will, uh, it will happen I hope for you so the car industry is working on a number of very uh, disruptive innovations and first of all uh, everything around autonomous cars so that clearly uh, is uh, very promising but when will it come? Is it just around the corner? Or uh, when can I buy one? Uh, uh, what will it mean for cities? What would it mean for insurance industries? So uh, I'm dying to hear the answers of uh, our guests. So let's start with uh, Vincent. What are your ideas on that? Well, I think, yes, the technology is right around the corner. And I'm just uh, like everyone watching the videos on YouTube <laughs> saying the advances on some of the car makers on this field. You can see the vehicles that drive themselves for like a few minutes at least without anyone touching the wheel. So I think you probably have to divide the adoption of this new technology per geographical areas. From my perspective, which is from France or Europe, uh, we are not known for being a very quick adopter of the new technology. And I, I suspect the social acceptance of this technology will be pretty, pretty tough. Uh, so I see it coming in other countries, other areas, uh, like the United States or any other countries that are typically known for being very adoptive of these new technologies. But yeah, maybe a bit later here. Okay. Karim, any ideas on what would it mean uh, for your company, for cities, for uh, insurance industry, whatever? Uh... I think it's important to separate uh, what we mean by autonomous cars as level three of autonomy, not want to sound too technical, but level three is human assistance required. Um, and currently Teslas with autopilot have that. We rent a lot of Teslas in our fleet and you know, customers can you know, press on a button and the uh, car drives by itself. Uh, I think the, the um, passion around uh, you know, autonomous cars is really level five, i.e. robo taxis, no human uh, assistance required. And that is uh, a huge question mark. There's been a lot of hype in the last seven years and then all of a sudden you know, all went silent. And I think the reason for that is that engineers are uh, wrapping their heads into a very complex equation, which is let alone regulations and what it means from an insurance perspective. Um, for a, a level five autonomous cars to thrive in a city, you, have, you, know, you need to have an environment, an infrastructure that allows that, you know, clean roads, signage, and so on and so forth. But you also need 100% autonomous cars around. The idea that you can couple non-autonomous and autonomous cars is what renders the whole equation super complicated because you cannot train systems to very unpredictable behaviors which is human-led. If I drive a car that's non-autonomous and right next to me there's an autonomous car that's, you know, whose algorithm is trained to anticipate a couple of things, humans are very unpredictable. We're good drivers, but we're very unpredictable. And so all of that is making the whole thing complicated. So I don't think this is around the corner. And in many cases, when you look at interviews of big execs of autonomous companies, they all say that it's not within the 10, 20 next years. 
uh, again, not, not, not an expert of that topic, but I think level three is right now available. Level five, robot taxis, is, is a different ballgame. Okay, Alistair. Thank you. I mean, I think we see, as Karim has said, level three is, is there today. Um, but you don't have to own a Tesla to have autonomy within your vehicle. You know, many mainstream vehicles have things like active braking, lane assist. They will even park themselves. So we have an element of autonomy here now. I think the difference between level three and level five, as we've heard about, uh, comes down to society and society need, needing to catch up with the technology. Um, there's a security question that needs to be answered. How do we prevent these vehicles from being hacked and, and giving the, the peace of mind to the well, it's not the driver anymore, but the passenger of the vehicle. Um, and then also there's, a, there's an insurance liability question to answer. What happens when it goes wrong? What happens when an autonomous vehicle interacts with a, a vehicle being driven by a person? Where does the liability question end and where does it finish? So I think that those need to be answered first. But if we project forward to that uh, utopian level five with all of the vehicles uh, autonomous and linked together, you know, we will see fewer accidents. We will see a reduction in congestion and we will see um, better uh, emissions for the environment. And actually at that point, what happens then? You know, then our vehicles become less of a, a machine that we have to pilot from A to B and they become a space to consume media. And I think at that point, you know, things will be very different. Okay, that looks very promising, but then uh, still uh, um, not for tomorrow, then the level five uh, autonomous car. Okay, uh, so uh, let's switch to another topic uh, all about uh, uh, connected cars. Uh, cars are more and more connected amongst each other, but are also connected to your house. Uh, is it a gimmick? Uh, how can it help or improve the driver's uh, experience, the passenger's experience? What are your ideas on that? So maybe Alistair, uh, I'll start with you this time. Thank you. Uh, it's not a gimmick at all. I mean, we see today how um, how the connected car is improving the, the driving experience, even if it's just taking CarPlay or Google's equivalent. Um, you know, there are 600 plus models in the market now that are CarPlay equipped. Apple believes that by next year, 250 million vehicles will be on the road that can connect to, to one of their smartphones. Um, and, you know, a vast proportion of users, 40% plus, say that it is the only use of uh, in-car entertainment that they, they have is CarPlay. So I think that is there to stay now. Uh, and I think, you know, that will continue to evolve and that will continue to uh, drive our interactions and our connectivity. Uh, and actually our smartphones will be the, the, the key element of all of that, whether we're in the house, we move in transition to the vehicle, it'll all be through our smartphones that we consume all of this media. Okay, Vincent, any ideas? Yeah, we, we have quite a bold opinion here uh, at Carlili. We think that the connected car is, is great, obviously, for car owners, but it's more of a nice to have. When it comes to car rental, and this is where we operate, that becomes a must have, just because you can, uh, follow the usage of your customers, of your users, with, which will use different cars along the way. Uh, and therefore, if you connect it to the car, you can adapt the vehicle to the need of your user on the way, on a long run. Uh, so you will select a car depending on how you know the profile of your user. But after that, more than that, we deliver the vehicle and we're able to customize, to set up the vehicle itself for the, for the user. For example, you can have your own Spotify uh, list, music list, uh, set up for you. It's not ready today, but that's something we can imagine for the future. You can have your own uh, uh, environment inside the vehicle that will be totally um, yours. And that's another way to see uh, the switch from ownership to uh, car sharing or on-demand usage. Karim? Yeah, I think I'd uh, agree with what's been said. I'd be more bullish than uh, Vincent on, on how connectivity is important to us. It's, uh, it's, it's a backbone of everything we do, right? And if I just give you examples on what we do on the customer front and what we do on the, on the fleet management front, um, you know, on the customer front, uh, there's no way out connectivity to use our service. It is at the heart and the DNA of everything we do because, you know, our customers, by definition, unlock their cars with their phone. So our smartphone are connected to the car. Once they get in there, uh, they can have, and during the whole journey, the information on the sta status of the cars during the whole um, duration of the rental. And so tire pressure, um, you know, how much fuel is embarked, uh, geolocation of their car, and so on and so forth. And we, we think that's, you know, things that are hugely important to enhance the customer experience. So there's so many features that we're currently working on because we're connected to cars. 
Uh, and on the fleet management side, I mean, we are connected to 100% of the connectivity data that comes in from car makers. And that, you know, what it really allows is proactive sort of intervention. I know instantly what is the tire pressure on each tire. I know how much washer fluid is embarked in the, in the cars. And that is a revolution in terms of fleet management. And so we've developed tools around, fleet management software tools around that connectivity. Um, and I think in order for us to scale and become a massive mobility company, um, and that's the head start that we have versus traditional uh, car rental companies. So it's paramount to us. And I'd add to that that it's obviously not a gimmick. And that's the reason why massive companies, such as the biggest giant tech companies of this world, are specifically interested in that space because they know that they're better than classic OEMs to produce that. Um, so we're going to see a lot of innovation going forward. Okay, Karim, I have uh, another question for you. So uh, we see lots of innovation already happening in the car industry, as we've all debated on. But um, what is the next big thing uh, that the motor industry will invent, will surprise us with? Uh, do you have any ideas uh, on that? I think long term, without a question, uh, autonomous level five, uh, you know, we don't know when it's going to come, but when it's going to hit, it's going to be massive in many ways, as Alistair mentioned. Short term, I'm very uh, bullish about like, electrification for what it means in terms of, uh, you know, uh, living in a more sustainable world, but obviously what it means in terms of, um, you know, it, it sort of changes the, the, the face of the industry. As I was saying previously, the barriers to entry are suddenly going down. Um, many new entrants are coming in. And what that means is that there's high, higher competition because engines are now, now batteries. And so the whole focus is going to be how can I make that software inside the car so good that customers actually enjoy themselves? Um, and that is a redefinition of what the automotive industry used to be for the last 100 years. Um, and I think that competition is always healthier and better for end users in terms of safety and in terms of customer experience. And so I'm very excited to see what unfolds there. Okay. Vincent? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to introduce a new product that we're launching at Carlyly today. Uh, we are providing our technology, so our know-how, service and technology, our platform, for OEMs. And so we have a first uh, very big uh, customer. I wouldn't give the name today because we haven't launched it, but uh, it's uh, one of the best players in the world. And they use our technology just to propose a new business model, which is to allow people to switch their vehicle. So they can drive on a daily basis with a small electrical vehicles, let's say, uh, which will be lim limited for 150, 200 kilometers. Super good for the environment, by the way. And whenever they want to, to go longer distance, they will use our service uh, and switch to another type of vehicle. And I'm a big believer in this new product. I think it's, uh, it's, it, it can be massive on the market because it's a way to increase, to enhance the adoption of electrical vehicles very fast. Okay, Alistair? I think picking up on, on the comments that Vincent uh, and Karim have already said, I think we're going to see big innovation in the electric, electrification and the EV market. I think 600, 700 kilometers per charge will become standard. Some of the vehicles will be 1,000 kilometers plus. I think we're not very far away from that. Um, I think also in terms of the, the charging mechanism, I think we're seeing big changes in that. Already house building companies are integrating them as standard in new, new developments. So I think you know, the ability and the, the freedom and the convenience of charging will, will increase significantly. And then if we look at the connected vehicle as well, from my own perspective, from a roadside assistance perspective, I think that's going to change fundamentally in the coming years. I think we'll move away from the 100 year plus model of arriving at roadside to try and fix a problem to working with the connectivity of the vehicle to identify problems before the customer breaks down and, and then helping route them into a, uh, a model where they can, they can remove that pain point before it becomes severe. Okay, Jesus, so much innovation happening all around us. So uh, my last question for all of you would then be, what advice do you have for everybody who's uh, uh, tuned in? Uh, do I have to own a car, buy a car, rent a car, lease a car? or just basically uh, buy a bike. Alistair, uh, what would you say? Well, buying a bike is very healthy, Jeff, as you, as you well know. Uh, I think the car, the car itself is changing significantly. It's becoming more efficient, it's becoming smarter, and it's becoming more autonomous. Um, the industry is changing. We've got new players coming in, and the barriers to entry, as we've talked about, are removing, which is really exciting. Uh, and then the attitudes of the driver are changing. Um, and the vehicle will become more about a mechanism to get from A to B, and in the future, consume media. I think if we look at today, it's very difficult to argue not buying an electric vehicle or a hybrid vehicle. 
plans are? Yeah, I share that. Um, yes, if I have to give an advice, I would say buy a, bike, a bicycle. Sure, do it, do it. It's great for your health. It's great every day. I ride my bicycle every day. So do you, Jeff, yeah. I think. We haven't uh, encountered each other yet in Paris, but <laughs> maybe yet, someday. Not yet. Yeah? But yeah, sure. I mean, that's the best advice you can give. And use alternative cars for some random usages. We provided a great service, I think, at Carlyle. But Vietro is also an amazing service. So you can use many different ways to, uh, to enjoy your car on unfrequent moves, I would say. Karim? Oh, thank you for the, the kind words. I, I was about to give you a very self-centered uh, answer, which is just use virtual. If we happen to be in a city where you are, uh, again, going back to uh, what's been said today, uh, people's relationship with cars is changing. Um, we've been historically buying cars for the last 100 years. We'll be buying trips uh, in the next future. Uh, and that means that, uh, truthfully, uh, the luxury that we have today is to be able, uh, again, when you live in a dense city, to choose and have options. And I'd say uh, we have a policy at Virtual, which is uh, sort of our mantra, is use a small vehicle. A small vehicle can be a bicycle for small trips and use a big, big vehicle for big trips. It's as simple as that uh, because it is you know, way more efficient, way more sustainable. And then if you do that, uh, we think it's a victory for yourself financially, uh, but also for, for our cities and the planet. And therefore, having luxury is um, the way to go. And so not being committed to anything and being able to choose. Okay, so I would like to uh, end our uh, live innovation talks here. So thank you uh, to our three guests. Uh, I learned quite a few things. So first of all, there are a number of very important evolutions which are uh, taking place. First of all, the electrification and everything which goes with it, the autonomy uh, of the cars, uh, and uh, people's relation towards car ownership is also uh, changing. And so we are in front of a very exciting future uh, because we will all live that and to see that evolution happening. Um, for our uh, viewers, uh, uh, you can always watch the show later on. Uh, it will be on YouTube. And uh, I will see you next time on the AXA Live Innovation Talks.